Welcome to part three of this Turing 6502 build. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. So I've made the case in the last two videos that a Turing machine, and therefore a general computer, can really be thought of as being a rule book and a notepad, plus a way of keeping track of where we are on the notepad and what rule we're using. Here's our template for the 256 symbol machine. From now on though, I'll just call this the 8-bit machine. And then I showed how this can be reduced down to just a four symbol machine which really is the equivalent of a CPU with a one bit ALU. That's because the underscore and the dollar are really only used to keep track of where we are on the tape. The zero and the one are the only ones involved in computation. Here's the prototype board. And here's it running. And yes, it is very slow. The reason it's really so slow is because of this the sequential layout of the memory. The net effect is that it can take millions of clock cycles to access a byte in one of the upper pages. Compare this to the 6502 itself, which can access any byte in memory in one clock. One way to expand a Turing machine is to have multiple tapes. And it's been shown that having multiple tapes doesn't actually give you any extra functionality. It can give you extra speed. So I'm gonna separate out the 6502 registers in the emulation and we can see that reflected in the design of the Turing 6502. But now I want to walk through the steps that led to this final design, which does operate in real time. This is from the Western Design Center's data sheets for the 65C02. These are the registers visible to the programmer. An accumulator, two index registers, a program counter, a stack pointer, and a status register. And in the emulator, I'm going to use the term variable rather than register. I think this more accurately reflects what they are. They don't have a fixed hardware structure. They're just assigned a location in memory. But modeling the registers in the design was a given. The 6502 has all the program of visible registers, but it also has a B register and an instruction register. But on top of this, I had to model some effective address registers. This is how I laid out the variables on the Turing tape, and it's kind of arbitrary. But under the strictest definition of a Turing machine, I'm only allowed to move left or right once per clock cycle. So it would take 12 cycles to step from the status register to the index Y register. Now I didn't want to pay this penalty, so I allowed random access into the 6502 variable notepad. Now I can step from the status register to the index Y register in one clock. So when I do a write to these variables, this is where the data actually goes. Into the 6502 notepad RAM. Now, one of the things I noticed in the emulator was that the address for the external memory reference was always stored in the program counter or the effective address register. So now what I want to do is shadow the values in these variables in some external flip-flops and then connect these flip-flops up to the address bus of the external memory. And I'll need some sort of mechanism to select one of each pair, but I'll worry about that a bit later. To help implement this, I'm going to introduce another chip, the 74HC138. Now, this is a very well-known and loved chip. It has three inputs and eight outputs, as well as some enables. It takes a three-bit input and converts it to a one's hot eight signal output. Each output is normally high, or five volts or in the logical one position, but when the corresponding value is presented to the input pins, that output goes low, and only that output goes low. Now I want to connect the outputs from the 138 to the octal D-type flip-flops I've just added, and the input to the 138 comes from the notepad address lines. So now, the values in the PC and the EA variable in the emulation are mirrored in the output flip-flops. Now I'm going to get even trickier. I'm going to set the lowest input bit to zero. As a result, outputs 1, 3, 5, and 7 will never be selected. This means PC high and EA high are both written into the PC high flip-flops, and PC low and EA low are both written into the PC low flip-flops. Because of this, I'm going to relabel these flip-flops the memory address registers. And in the emulation, the burden will be on me to keep track of what's in them. Now, it's starting to seem a bit silly to use a 74HC138 just to control two signals, so I'm going to get rid of it. And in their place, I'm going to use two new signals which come from the notepad location. And these signals need to be gated with clock, so we don't lose data in back-to-back -back writes. I'll give an example of this in a later video. And there we have it. That's how we get to the Turing 6502 design. 
And now I'm going to talk about clock. We want a clock with nice sharp edges, and we want clock bar to be the perfect inverse of this. But if I just generate clock bar through an inverter, then there'll be a slight delay between the edges of clock and the edges of clock bar, and this can really upset a circuit. To solve this, I need to introduce a new gate called the exclusive OR gate. This is also called the XOR, and it has the properties that when both inputs are the same, the output's low, but if both inputs differ, then the output's high. So now if I use two of these gates, and wire the top one so that the inputs are zero and clock, and the lower one has an input of clock and five volts, then between them they should produce clock and clock bar, and both of these signals will be delayed by the same amount, which means they'll be in phase with each other. So that's the clock circuit done. Now I want to look at the signals that go into the memories in a bit more detail. What I've called the system memory, or the Apple II memory, actually consists of both a ROM and a RAM. The address and data lines of these are wired up in parallel, but they have different control signals. And the easiest way to implement this was just to add these control signals to the behavior, so they're represented on the behavior output flip-flops. And the behavior output flip-flops are just part of the current rule flip-flops. So this means selecting between ROM and RAM is controlled by the rulebook. To work out some of the other signals though, I need to go back to the timing diagram. Previously, I did the notepad symbol lookup after the negative edge of clock, and now I want this symbol to either come from the 6502 notepad or from the system memory. So I'm going to introduce this new signal called mread, which is generated by the rulebook, which controls whether the notepad or the system memory is read. Then we proceed as normal, and after the rising edge of clock, we always write the value back to the 6502 notepad. But now we have another signal called mwrite, which tells us whether to write this symbol back into the main memory or not. We can connect the mread signal directly up to the 6502 notepad output enable pin, then NAND it with clock bar and connect it to the output enable of the main memory. So while clock bar is high and mread is low, we read from the 6502 notepad. But when clock bar is high and mread's high, we read from Apple system memory. We run the write signal through an exclusive OR which we can ignore, then NAND it with clock and connect it up to the write enable of the system memory. And again, I'm using the term system memory, main memory, and Apple II memory interchangeably. Now we've made some changes to the rulebook, and I need to reflect this in the rulebook entries. Previously, I introduced this nomenclature which means right six on the notepad, then go to rule Q6 and move left on the notepad. But now we no longer move left or right. We jump directly to the location we're interested in. And we have some other signals such as mread and mwrite that we have to worry about. So I want this to read right six on the notepad, then move to rule Q6, move the notepad to accumulator and assert the mread signal. All right, we're nearly ready for the build. In part two, we built this notepad, but now I want to expand it so I can connect it to an Arduino Nano and ultimately connect it to a PC. I'm adding in these 74HC257 chips. These are two to one multiplexers, and I'm going to connect them to the address bus of the main memory. When combined with the 74HC245, which is connected to the data bus, it means the Arduino Nano can snoop on all memory transactions. The next video is the bring up video, and I'll explain it in more detail there.
And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe and share.